Ah, yes, we're about to run out of oxygen. One of the staples of science fiction. Now, the bad ones I'm talking about would not include a scene like this. Running out of oxygen in a spacesuit is a realistic uh, possibility, and it would occur swiftly. The strength of this scene in the film Red Planet is the astronauts behave rationally. There isn't a death fight over someone's oxygen canister or anything like that. They all decide to try to be calm, still, and maximize their life. There's also the lack of a computer countdown. I cannot stand it when a computer goes running out of oxygen in five, four, three, two. That would be the equivalent of saying you are about to finish digesting your supper in five, four, three. Biological processes are not like your cell phone power where it's just going to cut off at a certain voltage threshold. So you can't really predict the moment you're technically out of oxygen. And what's really going to kill you is the rising CO2 in the suit and they're going into what's called hypercapnia so discussing the acidosis in the blood and yeah it's going to be terrible is really accurate um having inhaled higher percentages of carbon dioxide that is recommended and having heart problems i can tell you it's really unpleasant so i would in fact do what the character is doing rather than die of high co2 which is really unpleasant i would open my helmet and vent to the low pressure atmosphere and die of hypoxia which has happened on many of an aircraft accidentally you just go to sleep I've suffered from hypoxia once too and it's quite pleasant there are about three kinds of basic death due to respiratory issues two of them we can share on earth there can be a fire which can fill the air with poisonous chemicals like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and a host of others. Straight up suffocation, where you're trapped in an enclosed space, the oxygen levels fall, the carbon dioxide levels rise, and you get a twofold death. The third possibility is exposure to a vacuum where you lose complete containment on a spaceship or a spacesuit and you vent to a zero percent atmosphere. If you vent to a vacuum, you have about 15 seconds of consciousness in which to engage in self-rescue. At that point, a process called osmosis has been reversing in your body and oxygen is leaving your blood heading to the vacuum of space. This is why you can hold your breath far longer than you can be exposed to a vacuum. Holding your breath while exposed to a vacuum, you will just embolize. It has been proven that astronauts or people that were engaged in research have survived up to about a minute exposed to vacuum and were resuscitated. But you have about 15 seconds to do this yourself. Hollywood almost always gets this wrong, despite 2001 A Space Odyssey showing it correct in 1968. The entire scene was in fact taken from an Arthur C. Clarke short story about an astronaut forced to jump between two damaged sections of a ship and be exposed to the vacuum of space, which is now a routine scene in I don't know how many movies. It was done in 68. Give it a rest. If I like these two movies, which ones could I possibly object to? Well, why don't we start with some low-hanging fruit with an Arnold Schwarzenegger film. Air systems on spacecraft, on space bases, on uninhabitable planets, are often turned off by our evil villain. And apparently, they use ordinary fans to move air through these systems. Any HVAC guy really doesn't like these kind of movies. Nobody anywhere uses these fans for bulk movement of air through any system at all. Hollywood apparently doesn't have HVAC people working for them. They like the appearance of these fans and it makes for a great action scene where our heroes have to try to get past the evil fan with sharp blades in the ductwork while the monster's chasing them. 
but it just isn't done. Hollywood, though, just can't let it go. They have to have giant fans in the air or even underwater, like in a James Bond film, that can threaten someone with being chopped up at any given time. I suspect somewhere in the 1950s, there was a contract signed to buy tons of fans, and these fans get reused, just like the PK meter in Ghostbusters keep showing up over and over again. The props people are like, well, I got this. You want to borrow it? Sure, sure. You got a big fan, too. So we always have these scenes where people could be sucked into these fans. These fans are not good for transporting large amounts of air from one location to another. They will tumble the air in a room, but will not migrate the air long distances. So we have to have a bulk air-moving style fan, and these are called centrifugal fans. Centrifugal fans are often called blowers or squirrel cages because it looks like a race wheel that a squirrel or a rat could use. They use a high-speed impeller in there, and it flings the air outboard. They're extremely efficient on air moving, and I guarantee you every air moving system in your house, in your car, is using one of these designs. You can also see the design on the roofs of buildings. They have a very distinct look, and you will see them on the top of virtually every building, every restaurant. This design is pretty much 100% of air moving systems in use in the world today. I'm always trying to show my students how form follows function, how you can look at something and understand how it works. Some of these centrifugal fans are disguised in these pot style called up blast or down blast one. If you look at the one on the left, there's some pretty obvious design changes to it to make it suitable for the restaurant industry. It's a giant grease cup so this way you don't blast the roof of your building with the grease from your fryer. I guarantee the one on the left is a kitchen blower. The one on the right better not be. All our buildings on Earth are well ventilated. We have ventilation systems, but Earth itself has powerful built-in ventilation system called convection. Convection requires gravity to operate. Hot gases get less dense and lift upwards. Hot air balloons lift upward because they are less dense than the surroundings. However, in the zero gravity of space, convection will not operate. Even in our large, sealed, modern office buildings, if the entire ventilation system failed, there is still a temperature differential from the top to the bottom of the building, from the sunlit side to the shadow side, so air currents would form anyway in such a building. And in fact, in some buildings, they can become a nuisance if the air is allowed to change density and buoyancy along the way, and it can create wind uh, tunnels inside the building. In space, however, none of that's going to operate. So if you want air to move from one end of the spaceship to the other, you've got to push it. This has led some people to believe that if all fans were shut off on the space station, you would suffocate where you're sitting. Well, that's not really true. They've demonstrated that fire does find a way to keep burning in space, but the chemistry of the fire alters, and it's certainly by the naked eye, you can see how it's harder to deliver oxygen to the flame. But even one cursory examination, you're getting a very large area. Now, would an astronaut suffocate if you tied them down and you shut the fans off in the room? Would they suffocate on the spot? Well, not particularly, because you can blow air. 
exhaling really rapidly would blow the air away from you, but you would certainly accumulate more carbon dioxide in your environment. So I suppose if an astronaut was dead asleep in their sleeping bag, breathing very quietly, if you cut the fans off, let the air go stationary, they might accumulate an unhealthy dose of CO2 in their immediate vicinity. But it's unlikely. There are far more realistic dangers that would threaten an astronaut's oxygen supply. Stardate 3142.8. They have my ship discarding their own worthless vessel. Only moments of air left on the bridge now. Commendations recommended for Lieutenant Uhura, Technicians First Class Thule and Harrison. Lieutenant Spinelli. And of course, Mr. Spock. One of the best episodes of Star Trek featured Ricardo Montalban, who took over the Enterprise and planned to outfit it in rich Corinthian leather. And he and his actual real chest, both then and in 1982, became the greatest villain in the Star Trek universe. And like many villains in space, he decided he needed to deprive the people of air. Let's examine this scenario on board the Enterprise in detail. How long our air supply is going to last is a function of human metabolism. And the basic human metabolism is this formula here. This is the formula for respiration. Respiration is not breathing. Breathing is... <sighs> respiration is simply the process of using oxygen and food to release energy and some carbon dioxide. A worm does not lie there going, ha, 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 if it did, run. There's something wrong with the worm. All animals respirate, not all animals breathe. What's that formula on the left? That is sugar, C6, H12, O6. When you eat food, your body will need oxygen to oxidize it, releasing water and carbon dioxide. If you look at this formula, for one molecule of sugar, we need six molecules of oxygen, which will produce six mo... Let's keep it simple. One scoop of sugar and six scoops of oxygen will make six scoops of water and six scoops of carbon dioxide. That's pretty much simple. We can talk about it as scoops. This means there is a ratio of one to one. For six scoops of carbon dioxide, you breathed in six scoops of oxygen. The ratio of carbon dioxide created to oxygen consumed is called your respiratory quotient. Sugar has a one-to-one -one respiratory quotient, meaning that for the six oxygens you needed, you produced an equal number of carbon dioxide. This is higher than fats or proteins. Sugar is not green in the sense that it produces the highest amount of CO2 for your consumption. Please don't go out and stop eating sugar. It's necessary for your survival. The only thing that will make more CO2 than eating sugar is to eat oxalic acid and amaranth or tartaric acid and grapes, and neither one's going to feel terribly good. So this is about as bad as it gets. You will produce as much CO2 as the oxygen you breathed in. But how do you measure it? What do these numbers mean? We can talk about them as scoops, but how does a formula counting atoms and molecules convert to the scale of the universe that we're on? Well, there's a concept called moles. We have to find a way of turning the six scoops of molecules into mass at our level. And there's a rough conversion using this idea of molar measure. One mole of oxygen weighs 32 grams. The number six you're looking at is six moles. What is a mole? It's a huge, gigantic bundle of 
molecules. It's like saying how many grains are in a pound of sugar. It's like you don't really want to count them individually. You're getting this big package. And this is going to allow us to calculate our daily needs in terms of oxygen and our daily waste. According to NASA, we need 0.84 kilograms per day. That's what they budget on the space station. Given the density of oxygen, not air, we're talking the oxygen in the air, we work out that we get 600 liters a day of oxygen to keep us alive. And that pretty much agrees with any other calculation I've seen. Now, what does this turn into as carbon dioxide? Well, we have to do a little count. 840 grams of oxygen when oxygen is 32 grams per molecule or box of molecules works out that you need 26 moles of oxygen. And if you look at the bright blue numbers in front of oxygen, water, and carbon dioxide, they are in identical ratios. So to get the total amount of carbon dioxide I breathe out, I multiply the 26 by 44 and I get 1.2 kilograms. Using the density of CO2, it works out to 602 liters. So literally, we breathe in 600 liters of oxygen during the day and we breathe out almost an identical amount of CO2. Notice the mass is very different. Carbon dioxide is oxygen with this extra carbon tacked on. It weighs more, but it's a little bit denser, so it winds up taking up very little more space than the oxygen you breathe. We don't care about the water. I only did the water calculation because I needed to prove to myself that when I was done, all the masses are accounted for. So the two masses on the left of the arrow add up to the two masses on the right. I didn't make a stupid mistake because I'm prone to them. Now we can work out the Enterprise scene. When I went to Planet Fanboy and got the blueprints for the Enterprise bridge, it is approximately eight meters across. I'm estimating four meters in height because I know there's a dome on top of the Enterprise as well, and so I just took four meters because I'm a bit of a fanboy too, and I wind up computing 201,000 liters of air on the bridge. How long would this last then? Well, we need 600 liters per day. That's 25 liters per hour. 25 liters per hour for one person is 200 liters per hour for the eight people I counted in the scene. The air, though, in the ship is not pure oxygen. It's only 21% oxygen. So of the 201,000 liters on the bridge of the Enterprise, we only get 44 kiloliters of actual oxygen to breathe. The math is inexorable. 44,000 liters of oxygen being used up at 200 liters an hour gives us 220 hours? They're going to last 10 days? Um, once again, you live on this planet. You have some innate knowledge. There is no way the room you saw would furnish the air for 8 people for 10 days. You've committed a rookie mistake by assuming oxygen is consumed like cookies or gasoline, that you keep getting them until that last bite and then it stops. That is true of cookies. You can keep reaching into the cookie bag, cookie, 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 no more cookies. You're driving your car, it's running, it's running, it's running, it's running, boom, it stops. The car doesn't start slowing down as it reduces its gasoline content. It keeps the flow going till it stops. You don't breathe the room air and get the same amount of oxygen every single breath until the room literally runs out of air. That's why I hate the scenes where the computer goes, warning, oxygen supply will be depleted in three seconds. There's no such thing. You're breathing in the air, scavenging it. Think of it this way. I give you a swimming pool of water and I say, you can drink out of the swimming pool, but you have to pee into it as well. Sooner or later, you're not going to want to drink that water anymore. It won't be good for you. You are recycling the room air. 
So it's going to get worse and worse and worse. So this estimate is way off. But you already knew that in your gut, didn't you? Let's look at room air like it was a pizza. We have the pizza itself, which is the mostly nitrogen in the air. And we have all these little blue oxygen molecules that I want you to think of as pepperonis on the pizza. When the room is full of oxygen, there's lots of pepperonis on this pizza. You take a slice and you eat it and you get what looks to be about nine discs of oxygen. Nine pepperonis. That's great. But then later on you find the pizza, the next one, doesn't have as many pepperonis on it. If you eat a slice of that pizza, you're only getting about two pepperonis. So you're pretty much going to need to eat five slices of the lower pizza to get the same pepperoni count as one slice of the upper one. Now I know what you're thinking, that you could just pick the pepperonis you want, like collect all nine off the lower pizza, and you're legally allowed to be killed if you do that. No, this is the way it came. As the room air loses oxygen, each pizza slice, each breath you take, is going to have less and less oxygen in it. That is why you just don't suddenly run out. It's going to be a horrid process as every breath you take is going to get worse and worse and worse in terms of its efficiency. Another effect is going to kick in as well called the diffusion gradient. This is just a really fancy way of saying that people share their farts with everyone else in the room. It will migrate. A gradient is like a hill. There is something that's wanting to make a downhill motion. If we look at the air in your lungs, which is the same as the room air basically, you see that there's lots of blue dots in the lungs in the top right picture here. These blue dots do not like each other. The oxygen molecules do not want to be near each other. They will spread out. The blood supply is always kind of low in terms of its oxygen levels because you're using it up. So the oxygen will want to move from the lungs into the blood supply. That is the gradient direction. They will want to go downhill to get away from each other. But if the blood supply was completely filled already with oxygen, the ones on the hill can no longer roll downhill. They have no impetus to want to move if there isn't less crowded conditions. So what happens as the blood winds up having just as much oxygen as the room. So even though the room still has oxygen in it, eventually the level of oxygen is so weak that there's no more oomph to make it move into the bloodstream. You can reach a point where you're just gonna suffocate even when there's still air in the room. And if you were exposed to a vacuum, the lung has absolutely got zero oxygen in it and it will begin to vacuum the oxygen back out. But that's another time. Here's a calculation I did making a simple assumption. As the air in the enterprise gets thinner and thinner and thinner, how much faster would you have to breathe in order to get the same amount of oxygen in each breath or at each moment of time. For example, when the air is at 20% oxygen, you take one breath, you're good. When the air is at 10% oxygen, you're going to need to inhale twice to get the same oxygen. By the time about three days goes by, you're going to be breathing twice as fast as normal. And you might go, well, that's not so bad. I dare you to try it for two minutes, but sit on the floor first. But try to double your breathing rate for two to three minutes and see how well that goes. It, you're you're going to get exhausted really fast, okay? This is going to burn more energy. As you start increasing your respiration, not only will you not enjoy it, you will start to burn off more energy. So right off the bat, that's going to take away some of our time we have on the Enterprise. I plotted what the oxygen and the CO2 in the room would look like over that time period. And this is again for the 201 kiloliters of the Enterprise Bridge with eight people. The oxygen levels and the CO2 are counter to each other. Oxygen starts high, goes low, CO2 goes up. 
it looks like way over here on the far right where they cross, that is our, our death crossing. You're finished by then. How can I say that? 10% um, oxygen and 10% CO2, it's fatal for certain. This means we're talking little over four days now. Not 10 days, but just barely over four days and they're dead. No one's going to live in an environment with 10% CO2, 10% oxygen. They're fatal each on their own. This is a double fatal scenario. But wait, there's more. By 50 hours in, you have already fallen so far below the occupational limit for oxygen, you will be in hypoxic. You will start to have all the symptoms of oxygen starvation. You are not a happy camper by 50 hours. Anything after 50 hours is heading to death. Now our estimate has gone from 220 hours to 50 hours and we're in distress by adding in all the other effects that are going to happen. By 50 hours, there's going to be full-blown hypoxia on the bridge. It's always going to be the weak people. Never Kirk. Never Kirk. No. And the Vulcan, who knows, with his green blood. But you're in trouble within two days in that place. Yet another effect kicks in. Your body tries really hard to maintain the oxygen CO2 balance in your in your body. And they operate between a very, very narrow range. CO2 makes your blood acid. And your body tries really hard to keep your blood pH locked down to an extremely tight range. The more CO2 in your blood, the lower your blood pH goes. The lowest ever recorded that a person survived was 6.33 and at the high end 7.7. .7. And that's really, those two ranges are like a liter of water with a single drop of vinegar in it or a liter of water with like a pinch of baking soda. You have to keep your pH remarkably tight and CO2 will drive the pH down. Just look at my little model here, the teeter-totter. As oxygen falls, CO2 rises. As CO2 rises, the pointer is going to point to lower pH. When your body gets too much CO2 in it, it turns into your blood as carbonic acid, which you know is soda pop fizz. Your body counteracts any acid in your blood with two different approaches. One is behavioral. As CO2 rises, your brain starts saying, start breathing faster, and you begin <gasps> to blow off the CO2, and then your pancreas, while it's not busy making insulin, suddenly dumps a load of bicarbonate into your bloodstream, basically baking soda, and it tries to restore the balance to keep the CO2 from rising. This balance can be really hard to maintain if the atmosphere isn't cooperating. We'll look at the CO2 limit here. If you notice, unlike oxygen, oxygen starts at 20% and it falls to 10% and your risk of death. All CO2 has to do is reach 3% and you're already in distress. And by 8%, it's game over. So the carbon dioxide levels are what's driving this scenario. We'll go back to this. It isn't oxygen running to the 10% that's going to kill you. You're dead long before this point. You're dead even basically around the 50 hour mark because it's already getting too high. Here's what's going to happen to you. 25 hours into this, 31 hours on my simulation, you are now in breathing distress because of the level that the carbon dioxide has reached. At that point, oxygen has fallen to 18%, which is already going to be trouble on its own. So you're already going to be getting quite sick by 31 hours. The 4% level is called immediate danger to life and health. You're only a few hours away from a carbon dioxide level enough to be of serious concern. At 81 hours, you'll hit 8%. There's your range. The death zone is somewhere between 25 and 80 hours. It's game over. That's a lot, lot shorter than the original 220 hours, 
but it's already much longer than what the show seems to appear. You get the impression they were in deadly danger of bad air within the course of five or six hours or less. They've got in the one day neighborhood and they're gonna be in serious trouble in that room. And just to show you a final plot, this is 10 hours in that room. If you look at the oxygen level in blue, it hasn't even breached 20% and the CO2 level has already climbed up enough that people with health issues by about 10 hours would start to feel like, oh man, I need some fresh air. But you've got a solid 10 hours before uh, things are gonna start getting concerning on the bridge of the Enterprise. That would then put it at, within reason of the duration of the plot, they're not terribly far off symptoms but the unconsciousness they seems to indicate they've jumped the gun on it that the people fell unconscious far sooner than they would in reality in a room with that kind of volume so what's our final takeaway in this long-winded session on long-winded storylines 2001 the most accurate in terms of its portrayal of oxygen starvation killing you that quickly if exposed to a vacuum. Red Planet, accurate scene in terms of astronauts trying to keep their calm and cool and not going hysterical, dealing with the symptoms of high carbon dioxide. The lack of oxygen tanks on their suits seems to be a progressively more common feature. Maybe they have rebreathers, whatever. Star Trek. Excellent scene. they probably three times too fast for death. But within the confines of a plot, it certainly wouldn't be something Khan would have to wait a tremendously long time for before they had to surrender that room. The least realistic scene of the four clips I've shown you would be Space 1999. Despite it being my favorite episode, you can't simply shut the life support off to a cavernous spaceship and have three people start to suffer respiratory problems within minutes and the biggest lie is turning life support back on when you're nearly dead does not instantaneously put oxygen back in the room or allow other people to enter the room that is causing you to be on your hands and knees and safely rescue you without breathing apparatus. How come I haven't talked about Total Recall and its scientific um, accuracy or potentially lack thereof? Well, I would no more be willing to discuss this film's scientific accuracy than you would get a surgeon to sit down and discuss with you if the game operation is a quality simulation of real surgery. Or um, if I was the pilot of an aircraft and one of the flight attendants said, uh, Captain, there is a chemtrail conspiracy theorist who would like to come in the cabin and discuss things with you. It's not happening. So I'm not even going to touch this one. <laughs>